you know the the the, 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 the streaming model doesn't depend it doesn't depend on on, on mass consumption per se it, it depends on subscription just regularly uh, okay, subscribing that's it. that's it and then if and if they can display to their shareholders right that there's regular subscriptions then the share value of that streaming service stays robust and some people make money every day as opposed to the, the industry right which is storytellers and creatives making the money so basically streaming is like the soul piece of distribution <laughs> oh wait he said it <laughs> Greetings and welcome to another exciting installment of the Film Biz Show, the only show where we delve into in the industry professionals' minds to get an insight of the current landscape of the film and television business, both in South Africa and internationally. Please subscribe, like, comment, and turn on the notification button so you are aware of our future episodes that you will love so much. Now, if you're in, in this industry and you have not heard of this man, then I'm afraid that you have been living under a rock. Literally. His journey began after obtaining his bachelor's and honors degrees in both National Film Institute of Nigeria and AFTA in South Africa, Johannesburg. He has fulfilled his role as a director, producer, a writer for shows such as Shaka Ilembe, Ashes of a Red Cow, Sierra's Gold, House of Zwede, Zone 14, Isbaya, Jacob's Cross, Society, Squeeze Us, Room 9, My Perfect Family, Chesa 3, Follows the Street, Jewel, and so much more. His documentary, Burning Man, won him three golden horns. He's also one of the directors for this new show, Max Show, Red Ink. Very exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, he's done it all. Please, let's welcome the legendary director, producer, writer, and mentor, Adze Uga. Well done, brother. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank sir. You, thank you so much. Welcome. <laughs> that doesn't sound like me, though. But, hey. yeah. <laughs> it's always scary to see the work that you've done. And, and you think you've just started. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. You've still got some years ahead of you, too. I hope uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Adze, you are a household name who's done mm. a whole catalog of films, you know, that are widely recognized. But... My interest is, where did it all start for you? How did this uh, bug, how did you get bitten by this bug? Ooh, okay. Um, let me start by saying I think I was lucky. Mm. Lucky to have been chosen by the storytelling bug yeah. <laughs> as opposed to the one who chased the storytelling bug. And it began, you know, many years ago when I was still a child, the first of many siblings, <laughs> five Okay. To be specific, um, my dad worked for the uh, Nigerian version of the SABC, and he was an engineer, uh, and he used to come back home with a lot of broken VCR machines that needed to be fixed. And in those VCR machines would be some odd tape of an old TV movie, you know, from Hollywood or whatever. And we'd always get a glimpse, you know, of those films, and he'll, once the machine was fixed, we'd watch it all from beginning to end. And it was fascinating, you know. And bearing in mind that time in Nigeria, right, TV sucked. There really wasn't much on TV. TV began at 4 p.m. and ended at 10 p.m. That was TV. There was no private TV stations. There was nothing entertaining. Everything was government-based. And it was mostly talk shows to basically improve the quality of, uh, of people as opposed to entertaining them. So, so, so TV was really, really not, not, not a viable thing for anybody. It was just used for government propaganda. So those films were a fabulous breakaway, if you know what I mean. They were refreshing. You know, they opened up my eyes to a new world. You saw characters and you saw heroes whom you wanted to emulate and, and, and basically kind of like, you know, relate with. And, and that was so fascinating. On the one hand, my mother was a social worker. And she was just this fabulous storyteller. She could just keep you enraptured with stories for days, you know. And growing up in Nigeria at that time, you know, electricity was very scarce. People think load shedding is like a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's been there. And like, we've been having it. 
Mm. That's the old advert we'll say. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We've been having it. We've been yeah. having it. Uh, spend hours with no electricity, sometimes days and weeks. And so, of course, there was always this thing of gathering around and people talking. And mom was just very good at just telling our stories. And, and I suppose that was kind of how the culture just started, especially for me and my, my family. Um, and I just took to storytelling like a fish takes to water, you know, to the point that, you know, when I watch a film, you know, I go to school the next day and I'm the first person to gather my friends around to tell them the story about the film. To the point that, you know, our class teacher, when she had to mark, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, papers or something like that, and she needed the class to be distracted by something, she would call me up, stand in front of the class and tell them about a film that I saw. And 90% of the time I made those stories up, I just combined four or five different films. You know, <laughs> those who saw the films were, well, that's a lie, that didn't happen. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> people went, oh, but I, got, I mean, they, they were very, very enraptured, it worked. And, and yeah, and, and I wanted to just, you know, take it to the next level, you know. I wanted to be able to make people feel the way I felt when I watched the film. I think that was for me the biggest thing, you know, just to be able to share the emotion, the experience of, oh, what a journey, what a, what, what, I mean, you should have seen what this guy could do. He could fly, he could punch through walls, you know, he could run so fast, you know, whatever, you know, because, you know, we're dealing with things that were very, very restrictive and suppressive. So any kind of escapism was welcome. And, and I wanted to share that escapism with as many as I could, you know, and um, so, yeah, but at that time in Nigeria, there was no such thing as a film school. And given the economic situation, you know, given leaving the country to study was out of the question, you know, like uh, Trevor Gumbi would say, in this economy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was tough. So I, I tried to become an engineer like my dad because that way a future was guaranteed in terms of getting work and employment. But I, it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. As in, I found myself constantly being distracted by the screen. Like that one now, I can't help but just wonder mm. what's going on. <laughs> you know, so mm. I'm that kind of person. Um, I'll find myself spending money on books that had to do with film instead of my engineering books. Mm. Yeah, so I just discovered that, okay, you know what, I'm wasting my time. Here. I'm just not using my resources well. And I decided to make the switch. But then where was I? There was nowhere to switch to. There was no film school in Nigeria. Fortunately for me, you know, somewhere along the late 90s, uh, a film school was opened by the Nigerian Film Corporation, and I did not waste time. I just rushed there. I said, you know what, sign me up, I don't care. And that's how the journey started. Next thing, graduating, telling one or two odd films in Nigeria, and then coming to SA to carry on studying. Studied in SA, and I uh, found myself on film sets after studying, and they say the rest is history, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's an interesting journey. Yeah. And I'm sure you you witnessed the rise of the Nollywood film industry, you know? Yeah, I did, which I didn't want to be part of, mm. you know, because I, I felt like that was not um, what I wanted to be kind of attached to. I didn't want to be a Nollywood filmmaker because as much as I saw them and I knew what they were trying to do, you know, there was something about the way they were being done that didn't appeal to me. And, and I, they had fabulous stories, but the execution was so bad. And I thought, no, man, no, man. Interestingly enough, you know, while I was in film school in Nigeria, right, we had watched the Shaka Zulu series that was made here in 1987. And when I saw that, I was like, that's South Africa. And in fact, that was what inspired me to come to Essay to study. When I saw that Shaka Zulu series, I was like, if the South Africans can make movies like this, that's where I should be studying to know how to make movies, especially from an African context. So it's weirdly enough, I find myself now also working on a new version of Shaka Zulu. Yes. <laughs> you know, so things have full come circle, full right? circle, yeah. Full circle. So, so yeah, because Nollywood just didn't cut it for me, you know. Um, but that, that's a thing of the past now because Nollywood has come of age. Yeah. They've caught up, you know, they've improved their quality of presentation, their cinematography. Many things have improved. Definitely. You know, storytelling, yeah, it's, it's all there. So, yeah, so the, so the journey is still ongoing. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And, and, and you, you see, I mean, the South African and Nigerian markets are like two different markets, you know? Yeah. But no, I, 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 I am aware in the grapevine that some of these streamers have been interested in kind of carving out a narrative that can unite these different markets from different mm. territories in the continent. You, you, know, you, know, you know the funny thing about when um, Europeans say, oh, I'm coming to Africa. I mean, you've heard that before when mm -hmm. Americans say, oh, I'm coming to Africa. And 
and it feels like um, they're wrong for saying that because Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent with so many countries. I want to beg to differ and think they are right, that Africa is actually a country, you know, with, 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 with different tribes. It's just that, you know, politics and colonize, colonize, colonial, that word. Colonialism. Colonialism, yes, you know, basically broke us up into small segments and basically made us, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you know, divided, we're now. Uh, yeah, they divided us. Yeah. Divided us to conquer us so that they can take from us that sort of thing. But we are essentially one people. We've always been one people. We are Nguni, We are so many things, but we are one people, and and we've always been connected. You know, our stories have always been shared. Our experiences, our cultures, all of that has. It's been it's been one thing, and 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 that is the default position. You know, believe it or not. So, 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 so streamers are not really doing anything new when they try to bring together a narrative, let's say, from Nigeria and a narrative, let's say, from, from South Africa. These stories and these interactions have been happening before they could even be recorded. They've been happening. You know, it's, it's about identifying the opportunity of saying, you know what, this occurrence needs to be given its space on screen. Mm. And that's what we should be doing, yeah. you know, not treating it like a new thing because it's not a really a new thing. It's never mm. been a new thing. We've always been interacting. You know, it's just that, you know, our focus has been on other things, especially when it comes to the screen, mm. you know. And, and, and that has been, to a certain extent, you know, uh, responsible for the diminishing of the capacity of the industry. Right. You know, the reason why Europe is as strong as it is right now is because, you know, Europe have yeah. a sense of... Yeah, together. The collective. Yeah, they do. They are collective. They yeah. are collective. You know, the Asians mm. to have that sense. The Latinos also mm. have that sense. But, you know, we are, we are still suffering from the fragmentation of the colonial masters, mm. you know, to the point that when we, when we try to do something that involves um, two African countries, they call it Pan-Africanism. But, you know, when my ancestors walked from mm. the West, you know, of Africa to the mm. South of Africa, they didn't think they were... Mm living continents. As far as they were concerned, this is what it's, One trail. we've been having it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that is their perception. But then, mm. so, so it's all of these notions are not new. I suppose the, 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 the thing that is new about them is the packaging, mm. as in how do we package it and how do we present it and how do we make it uh, monetizable? Yeah. You know, how do we make it an industry? You know, how do we capitalize on it to, to benefit everybody? Mm. I know? think the one instance where it worked well was with Jacob's Cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that worked very well. Mm. That worked very well, you know. And, and, and it took some brave people to accept that this was a reality that mm. we should basically just point our camera towards and then have, mm. have, have a narrative generate, generated from that. It, it, was, it didn't take anything apart from courage, mm. you know. Yeah, something that Nigeria has not suffered as much as South Africa. I mean, one thing South Africans have been complaining about is you know, whenever, or Southern Africans, whenever there's iconic figures to be played, mm. you know, real strong men who've changed the narrative in history, mm. we always get the Hollywood stars come and play, like yeah. Ian Siret, I mean, Siret Zakama, mm. uh, in, uh, in Kama's father, yes. um, you know, the Nelson Mandela biopics and so on and so forth. Mm. But, but I feel Nigeria has such amazing stories you know uh, at least now up and up until recent i'm seeing mm. that they are kind of you know depicting some of these stories but yes. you know still narratives of the biafra war mm. what happened mm. there mm. the recent uh, you know uh, kidnapping of you mm. know these school girls that yes. have been happening mm. so but with nigeria at least you i don't think so it has been infiltrated to a point where you have another nation speaking on your behalf. Mm. Yeah, which is, I think it's a, you guys are, it's, Nigeria is still in a good space in that regard. But mm. I definitely agree with you in terms of kind of amalgamating, you know, ourselves to yeah. say, look, we are one unit and we should find a way of carrying the load together. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think um, South Africa's problem mm. per se has been its proximity to the West. Yeah. That has always been a problem, mm. you know, and that is part of its identity, of course, mm. you know, because when you think about what, consumption, mm. you know, entails in South Africa, most of what is consumed, you know, are franchises from, from, the, from the US or from, from Europe. Mm. In fact, weirdly enough, the, the, the current cinema system that's, that people know, Stekinuka and New Metro, they were actually American franchises, you know, and, and they came in to basically just, you know, present another market, 
you know, for American content, Hollywood movies, to find, you know, uh, more bums on seats so that they can generate revenue. They were never really locally, um, uh, what do you call it, I, I, position I can, companies. Sorry to interject, but I can agree with you on that because I have a friend who's working for one of the franchises, one of those mm. two franchises. Mm. And, you know, especially after COVID when, you know, sales were going down. Yeah. I mean, they were one with, they were even selling. I think a portion of, yeah. of the clinical has been bought or something yeah. like this. So he was telling me inside information. But he said the biggest thing, while, the, you know, he's got friends who were part of the DTI mm. and the, their biggest complaint, the DTI and, the, you know, all these institutes, IDC, mm. were saying we've never had a sit down with any of these franchises to say, how do we create content in-house? Yeah, I know. And isn't it crazy? Yeah. You have this huge distribution platform, and yet, but you're not even investing yeah. in, yeah, so yeah, clear. You yeah, no, yeah. no, clearly, I mean, so yeah. there's an agenda there yes. to, to keep it so that it serves Hollywood and Hollywood only, mm. mostly. So that's why even when the South African films are being made and they go there, they suffer short periods of rotation and they suffer also from given a limited number of screens yeah. because space has to be made for Fast and the Furious, mm. you know, and James Bond and, and all the other big movies that they need to be able to say, yes, they're mm. sending all over the world to kind of like, you know, <laughs> take over. And so, a huge lack of marketing as yeah, well. Yeah. Well, the marketing, the thing about these films come with their own marketing okay. budgets, you know. So the, the local films, of course, don't come with big marketing budgets. So that's also something that kind of discourages them from taking them on board. So we should, yes, have films funded by DTI and IDC, but those funds must also come with a marketing budget yeah. so that the films can be marketed very well. You know, I mean, it's crazy, you know, like McDonald's, KFC, and all of these other guys saw the market, they opened up, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why they enjoy the kind of revenues that they enjoy. But this, our cinemas, you know, want to keep, and notice this, I mean, every cinema in the country is in a mall. Mm -hmm. Only one is in the township, basically, which is Maponyo, but all yes. the others... And malls, mm. in suburbs. Point, but it still is a mall itself, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, but it's in the township. Yes. But all the others are in malls and suburbs. Yeah. When you think about it, so you ask yourself, who is the market? Who is the target market? You're so right. If all the, the cinemas are in malls so in suburbs. Right. But I guess it's also incumbent on us, you know, who are part of this this business, to say, okay, fine. Then, then what other gaps can we fill? Yeah. You also, know. So yeah, their loss yeah. is our opportunity, Definitely. and we should think about filling. Yeah. The, uh, Look, the, th the truth of the matter is that developing the film industry of any country starts with cinema. It starts with mass audiences, mass viewings. You know, having 200, 300 people seated in one place, dark, and having magic happen on the screen. It used to happen in the old days, you know, during apartheid, right? You know, bioscope culture and everything. You know, but, but China, India, you know, you name it, have all built their industries on mass viewings that is how you build an industry not on streaming you know streaming is like straight to video or, or, or it's what straight video used to be but but in america as well the the population moving en masse to to share an experience to share in a culture or in a narrative is how you build an industry it's how you create the culture but don't you kind of feel like i mean the reality is you know the era of of cinema is is kind of passing by right. well you will find one person who tells you that's not the case and that person is me. <laughs> no, I'm, from, I'm a firm believer in cinema. Cinema is not going to die. In fact, people started calling the death of cinema a long, long time ago. When, when TV was made, they said, ah, cinema is dead because now we have TVs at home. And then when the internet came, they said, ah, cinema is dead because we have internet. You know, the same thing is going to happen. Cinema depends. And it, it, cinema is part and parcel of humanity. It's, it's the reason why people go to the soccer stadium to watch a soccer match as opposed to sit down at home. It's the reason why people go out to party. You know, it's the reason why people actually club. Cinema is just another extension of, 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 of socialization, you know, and, and, and one that is even more meaningful because you learn from it as opposed to the others, you know. Somebody's going to score a goal in a soccer match. Mm -hmm. You go to a club, you'll spend money, you'll drink, and you have a good time. But if you gather... In front of a screen, you might just learn something. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But, so, so, yeah. my, so my belief is that that innate thing, that innate desire to share experiences, to share stories, right, you know, is still uh, being presented by the platform of cinemas. And as long as we as human beings have the need to rub shoulders with each other, cinema will never, never die. But don't you feel like now with, I mean, we in popcorn kind of microwave generation, 
people want quick things and that's exactly what streaming offers the young generation. True, but then look at what films like Oppenheimer have done. I mean, like, one billion. Barbie, you know, what, that, these are stories, mm. you know, pe- stories that connect generations and, gen- and that connect cultures. You know, I can go on and on and on. Fast and the Furious, all of these things are, they, they're living. But I, w- I wish in that list of yours, we would at least mention an indie film that wasn't produced by a studio oh. or a local film that yeah. did phenomenally well in the yeah. recent times. Yeah, well, so I suppose that's the end goal then, right? Mm. That, that we work towards getting films that are independent, you know, small budget, but with meaningful stories also performing the same, you know? But it, it, it used to happen in those days where films would be made for like $40,000. Blair Witch Project, for example, oh, yeah. would make millions. You know, Home Alone 2, or Home Alone, sorry. Home Alone will, that would be made for a million dollars will make 500 million. Sure. Titanic, okay, let's not go there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean, yeah. you know? So, and, 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 and the thing is that in Nigeria right now, as much as streaming is a big thing, the cinema system and the cinema culture is still very strong and pumping. Like there was a film just released a, a few months ago called The Tribe of Judah. It's already clicked a billion naira, first in history. How much is that in rents? Uh, it's about six million. That's good. Yeah, hmm. it's about six million from, is it six or 20? I'm not too sure. No, okay. 20. 20 million. Yeah, it's 20 that's million. Box yeah. office. Yeah, one, it's 20, uh-huh. 20 million. That's, uh, yeah. Hmm. Which, so, so the potential is there. And hmm. I, my mind you, Nigeria only has 50 screens sure. in the entire country compared to AC that has 800 screens. So AC has 800 screens, but once again, they are mostly in the suburbs, targeting only people who live in the suburbs. And the people in the suburbs in the entire country are about 3 million. Do you know that? Sure. And then people in the townships are about 39 million, which is mm. like 40 million. And yet the cinemas are not there. So it tells you the gap is just huge. Nigeria, thank God, luckily, you know, is very densely populated. You know, Lagos alone has like 20, close to 20 million people. So most of the cinemas in the country are in Lagos already. So if your film hits in Lagos, you know that you're going to actually have like a hit, you know. So, so if you had more cinemas in Nigeria, right, you multiply that 50 by let's say 100, right, it will be, you know, cinema, no, nobody will look at streaming. Nobody will look at streaming because the streaming model basically just keeps you busy, but it does not actually, it, it doesn't maximize the potential of the industry. Mm. You know, that's just the thing. And the reason why, of course, Nigeria is full of this insecurities now, kidnappings, yeah, and economic issues. But there was a time, you know, when people will flock to the cinemas and will make any filmmaker a millionaire overnight. India, like I said, is a, f- a fantastic example. India, it's a mass market cinema. China, the same thing. People pay the odd five dollars or two dollars, and they flock into c- cinemas and they watch a blockbuster. And the producers go money into the bank. That money filters to the actors because what are we saying here essentially? It's about building the capacity of an industry, so that you know uh, people can 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 become avenues for wealth creation. You know, stars. You know, brands, merchandising. You know, bringing t- together and ho- a whole ecosystem that actually begins with storytelling, you know, and, 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 and that is how I, in my capacity, or rather in my understanding, you know, where we should be positioning ourselves towards, you know, because otherwise, I'm not, I, don't get me wrong, I love what is happening with streaming. I'm happy that we're in the streaming culture, but I do know also that, you know, the, 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 the streaming model doesn't depend on, um, on, on, it doesn't depend on, on, on mass consumption. Per se, it, it depends on subscription, just regularly uh, okay, subscribing. That's it. that's it. And then if and if they can display to their shareholders, right, that there's regular subscriptions, then the share value of that streaming service stays robust, and some people make money every day, as opposed to the the industry, right, which is storytellers and creatives making the money. So basically, mm-hmm. streaming is like the soul piece of distribution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. You it said just, it. <laughs> Marcus is the one it who just, said it. It just goes on and, and yeah. it's a subscription. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I basically understand what you're saying. Now, I, I remember when um, they, they, they built the Soweto Theatre in Soweto, right? Mm. And it was struggling for a long time in terms of audience. Mm. And, um, you know, Obviously, I was very close to that kind of, you know, the people who were, you know, in the forefront of that. And the biggest problem was now, how do we change the culture from going to the club on the weekend to people going and sitting down and consuming stories? How do we take them back to where they come from? Look, 
It's no easy task. And, 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 and many people that uh, will hear this will not agree with me. They will think I'm, I'm, I'm being fantastic. Yeah. They will think I'm being naive. They will, they, will, they will think I'm not being realistic with what is on ground. Mm. And the truth of the matter is, is it, it, it was there, but it was truncated. So South Africa had a cinema culture. People in the townships used to actually flock to where there were screens and they would watch films. But because of the potential threat it presented to the government at that time, mm. it was interrupted, it was aborted. Mm. It was stopped because it was a means of gathering and people will now hear about the struggle, about, you know, get updates. And, and the government knew that we can't have this happening. So the government interfered mm. with the cinema system and we are all reaping the, the, the woes of those decisions now, which is the reason why the culture seemed to have stopped because, you know, you name it, state of emergency, you know, lockdowns, curfews, you know, I mean, you know, uh, bannings, you know, shutting, shutting down of, 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 of public gatherings. There was, there was just no way a cinema culture could have thrived there. In fact, they even shut down the idea of having South African black movie stars. Mm. Ken Gampu was already on his way to becoming our James Bond, yeah. if you remember, mm. you know, with his films that showed black masculinity, mm. you know, kicking butt, you know, taking out bad guys. And he was already like a star. People were like, oh, Ken, 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 Ken. They shut him down. He had to leave the country. You know what I mean? He had to just try and find a future somewhere else because they knew that once he became that iconic character, he's an artist, right? That was a problem because that means you could spread the narrative that they didn't want, you know? So, 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 so it's about undoing that. It really is about undoing that. So it's about starting with, of course, telling great stories that will actually get people to actually, you know, choose to inconvenience themselves and flock to a place to gather and enjoy cinema with friends, family, and even enemies. Mm. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's not an easy task. But one thing I do know is that it starts with telling the right kind of stories and making sure those kind of stories can only be found in the cinemas, not just you know, <laughs> in, the, in the streaming services platforms. Because somebody said that if you build it, they will come. Oh. If you know what I mean. It's uh, very interesting. Yeah. Now, with credits on dramas like Is by uh, Jacob's Cross, mm. which we've just mentioned, mm. uh, House of Zwede, you've demonstrated a versatility across different genres. Mm. Just tell me, how do you approach, you know, directing different types of, of, of genres? And do you have a, a preference in any particular genre? Um, I love action. <laughs> I love action. I love anything that helps me escape my present reality. Mm. You know, I, 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 and when it's done so well, you know, it resonates with me so, so much more. Mm. Um, I do like drama as well. Uh, drama is accessible. It's close to me. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm drawn to those two. I love laughing. Comedy also is a, something that I love. Mm. Um, I love making people laugh because I love sharing emotions. Mm. So, you know, if I laugh, if I hear a joke and it makes me laugh, I want to share the joke with somebody else. But, but to try and answer your question, I think um, my, I won't call it versatility, I'll call it humanity. Because so, I try to find um, my, myself in every story that I tell. You know, I try to find a connection between the characters, you know, that I see on, on, on the script page. You know, what, what is it about this guy that makes him like me or makes her like me? You know, so I try to wear their shoes. And, 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 and that takes, of course, you know, somebody, that, that takes me being open to engaging with, 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 with people as well as the actors who are playing those parts. You know, to, to, to find the, the, the shared humanity, the commonality. And the moment I'm able to do that, right, then I'm able to be able to say, okay, I can tell this story from a position of truth. You know, I always believe that as a filmmaker, you can't tell a story that you don't understand. That's number one. You can't tell a story you're not familiar with. You know, you, you, you can't. I mean, t telling a story is like writing a journal, if you know what I mean. And the journal is personal. You know, so, so if you're not honest with what you write in the journal, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, people can spot BS from a mile away. Mm, not so, true. Yes, so, so that's what I try to do. I try to, 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 to basically walk in the shoes of, of the characters and, and try to find some understanding 
that helps me kind of like navigate how to best position the story for the benefit of the audience. Mm -hmm. Because if I can't feel the character, right, then I, it's stupid for me to expect the audience to do, to feel it. That's powerful, man. But I mean, in this one instance, you, you kind of broke away from, from that and you created a documentary film. Ooh. The Burning Man. Now this received critical acclaim, mm. won multiple awards. Could you please just share your experience on this project and how it differed Ooh. from directing scripted content? The pictures were in every newspaper in the country and around the world. News reports said a mob had burnt the man alive. So it's funny, funny, funnily enough, the burning man is what I think changed my trajectory of storytelling. You know, it, it was the documentary project that taught me the biggest lesson of my life about what it means to be a director or a storyteller, weirdly enough. And, and the credit for that should go to, you know, Angus Gibson and Desiree McGrath, who were the producers and at that time, you know, my bosses. And, and what had happened, you know, just a little bit of background, was this was 20, 2008, and there were xenophobic riots in Johannesburg and across the entire country. And, and this uh, Mozambican man by the name of Ernesto Nyamwave, mm. you know, had been set alight and burnt to death in the East Rand in a, in a, in a township called Ramaphosa. Weirdly enough. Weirdly enough. <laughs> Why did I just see that? Oh, wow. Well, anyway. Uh, so, um, and, and his picture was all over the papers. You know, every, people saw it all over yeah. the world. BBC, CNN <clears throat> showed this image of this man being set alight. And, and so, and there was a Mozambican uh, producer who had asked uh, South, Af the South African counterparts, what are you doing about this? What are you saying? You know, because we can't have this. This is not us. So this group came together to say, okay, we're going to try and make some films to capture some of these stories, you know, to really say something about this incident or this really dark part, uh, part of our past. And I was approached to do the one on The Burning Man by Desiree, my producer. And, and I was nervous as hell, you know, and, I, and I'm not too sure why she chose me. Maybe she thought, okay, you're a foreigner too, you should be able to relate, you know? So I'm like, okay, maybe. Then I began my research, you know, trying to speak to the people who um, reported the story, for example, you know, tried to find people who knew him, who, and then it was a very extensive journey. And, and one that was very, very, very hard, I have to admit, it was very, very difficult telling that story for so many reasons, because it was not a story that was uplifting. I mean, it was about a man who had been killed, a man who was a father, you know, he was a brother, he was a husband, you know, and, 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 and it, didn't, it wasn't hard for me to relate, but then that relating was also difficult in itself because why would, you know, it's, it's, it's not where you want to go to yourself. as a human being because mm -hmm. of how traumatic the situation was. So, so that was the beginning of it. And by the time, you know, I had filmed, I was doing my own sound, I was my own cameraman. Sure. You know, I basically wrote the script. And of course I got help and input from Desiree and Angus. But putting everything together, you know, was quite tasking and quite overwhelming. And by the time I put together the first cut, right, I discovered that I'd done something. I'd removed myself from the story completely when I did the very first cut. And I still remember it clearly. Uh, it was a conscious choice that I made because I didn't want to be in that story. It was just too dark. So I wanted to give like an objective point of view of the story whereby I wasn't involved, where I didn't have a take on what was happening. And when Desiree saw it, she was like, nah, 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 that's not going to work because now you are just ACBC. It's true. It's now, you're just, now you're just being a journalist. You know, you've got no skin in the game. You know, go and put yourself in it. Because I was already in it because I'd taken those parts out. So, of course, now I went back and then I recut it and I put, you know, I, 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 I said how I felt, basically, you know, about the whole thing. And, and I remember dropping the DVD off for the first recut at my producer's house. And she wasn't at home, and, but her husband was at home at that time. So he saw the DVD and then he watched it. And the next day he came to the office looking for me because he had been crying the whole night after he watched Shoo. it. And he was like, this is, he had never seen anything like it before. And he just came to tell me that my life is about to change. <laughs> wow. That was, those are his exact words. Um, 
And then next thing, yeah, the documentary was going around, you know, went to DIFF, went to Germany, went to the Berlin Film Festival, you know, it was just going around. And I mean, there was even a, the what do you call, city of Johannesburg, mm. you know, in Rudaport had a, a, an Indaba where, you know, they call all the, the, seven, the public servants together and then they have this kind of a colloquium, whatever. And, and they basically showed the same film and they invited me to come and just present the film as well. So it was just all over the place, you know. And the biggest lesson there was, okay, you know, it's not about, you know, the, the, the fame and the fanfare and the what popularity. It was not about that. It was, it's now me understanding what, the power of being personal when you tell a story that they, all of a sudden just opened up to me that, okay, this is, this is really what it's all about. People want to hear you. Not me necessarily, but people want to hear you, your story. They want to know you, Marcus. They want to know what makes you tick. They want to know your fears, your flaws. They want to know, you know, what itches you want to scratch in your life because, because you are authentic mm -hmm. and you are true. And, it, and, 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 and seeing you, you know, reveal yourself, you know, empowers them to do the same, you know. And, and, and that is what basically, that, that, that was the approach that I began basically applying even when it came to fiction, narrative, storytelling. Now, just, just to touch on that, I mean, you know, South Africa now is, is, is very much getting into a space of adaptations of books and of stories and so on and so forth. Mm. Do you think the same applies, especially to an adaptation, let's say, of a novel? Or, or yeah. You still have to put in your own voice. Yes. Instead of just kind of just, transcri just transcribing, you know, one medium to the next. Yeah, you, you have to. I mean, you, you, it has to be a personal voice. Because a personal voice, like I said, it's authentic, it's tangible. Mm. You know, when you're, a personal voice is a true voice. It's a voice that's already existing. It already has scars. It already has flaws. It already has trauma. Mm. You know, it already has, uh, it, it has the organic history, you know, of, of, of character that you're not, you're not creating from scratch, you know. And when you do that, you know, you, the people feel the weight of it and they know that this is not uh, uh, something, that, it's not marshmallow, mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it's substantial. They can feel it. And it's been how, for example, Bomb approaches storytelling. Oh, yeah. Everything is rooted in, in, in a personal point of view and a perspective of truth because that is authentic you know it doesn't mean that that is the only truth you can have multiple truths which is okay but but at least you're experiencing one truth of a particular thing or one side of it mm -hmm. and and that will make you go think mm -hmm. you know that will make yeah. and that truth is focused and intentional it's focused and it's not trying to be everywhere no, it can be it, it's not possible you know yeah. you know you can only have that's why you the, the, the individual's identity is unique. There is yeah. nobody like... You yeah. know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically asking this because, you know, I've had a personal experience where we got rights um, to work on a, a, a biography, mm. you know, of this particular person who's had like an extensive life yeah. and it runs over decades, like three, four decades in mm. the South African perspective. And the writer that we got, you know, with the drafts that we had, it's mm. like, whew, this script is going everywhere. Like yeah. it's going, it's like, mm. you know, it's touching every decade. And, mm -hmm. and at the end you're like, wow, it was one long, you know, <laughs> you know, like uh, what do you call these things? You get at the obituary or something, yes, you know, exactly. he went here and then he yeah. did this and then he did that. Yeah. And there's no one perspective. So, so I, you, you know, know, so, I mean, I did a course a while back mm. when we were shooting Shaka Elembe and it taught me something, it's called Project Narrative. And it teaches you about, about storytelling. You know, and, and what, it, what, what, it, what it says is that there is no such thing as a true story. So sure. if I'm telling a story, so even the documentary, The Burning Man, as much as, you know, it was a documentary about a man who existed, right? It was still my perspective. And the moment, and that, my perspective is not authentic in the sense of the word. It doesn't sure. represent the absolute truth of it. It's one-sided, you know? It just simply opens up the possibility of other sides to the story, which is what actually we, we, we use in storytelling because we have to hook in the audience. And, and, and you can't hook them with many things. You know, all you need is just one hook. So even the project you just give, uh, for example, is whoever was doing the adaptation 
needed to adapt it from his point of view. Mm -hmm. So it meant that aspects of that character's story that appealed to his reality and his experience should have been how he tackled the adaptation and not from an objective point of view because it doesn't work. And then you got to jump on another very exciting, you know, co-production, mm. 10 Days in Sun City. I mm. remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> you know, people were interested because you brought, you know, Nigerian talent, mm. you know, mixed it up with South African talent. America International Passport with this uh, And the whole aim of it was to promote tourist destinations, mm. right? Um, so, and, and, and I'm sure there were some, some unique challenges you yeah. know, in terms of directing the film and so on and so forth. And trying to, you know, kind of work out a, a good balancing act between entertainment and promotional content. Mm. And funny enough, you know, this past week I was having, you know, obviously in a meeting where we'd been pitching work and so on and so mm. forth. And and um, so this this company was like, okay, well, this is a model that we can, we can kind of uh, explore, mm. which is basically bringing on brands to be a part of the mm. actual development mm. process mm. and working that out. Mm. And as much as, you know, I mean, right now we're always constantly worrying, where, where am I going to get the money? Mm. But once you bring on, uh, you know, a brand or someone with like a, a promotional mm. marketing branding mm. interest, it does kind of shift, mm. you know, yeah. Uh, how, how did you work that out? Well, look, I was lucky that the, the lead f for that, for 10 Days in Sun City, was A.Y. Malkun. A.Y. Malkun, for those who do not know, oh, is literally the big biggest comedian, comedian mm. on the continent. Mm. He's the biggest comedian on the continent. Some say he's the biggest movie star on the continent. Mm. You know, he is so big. I mean, he's got close to like 40 million followers on Instagram. Sure. That's how huge he is. So, and, 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 and he's an artist. He really is an artist. He's like one of the funniest guys we'll ever come across in real life. He, he, so, so that made it easy. And, and, and when we, we had never worked before, somebody recommended me to him. And when we began talking, you know, I was going to let him do his thing, but I was going to try and find the aesthetics of, of, of what made South Africa or Sun City as it were, you know, a tourist destination. Fortunately for me, I'd never been there too <laughs> at that time. <laughs> that was my first time. So when I got there for the first time, I was also a tourist. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So I was literally, you know, overwhelmed by what I was seeing. And I wanted to replicate that, that same experience for the benefit of the audience as well. So that was my approach too. So even the way I, I selected the, the kind of camera we use and the way the camera should move, you know, I mean, it was the first film I did without a tripod ever. Sure. To the DOP, we're not going to have this camera sitting on any tripod. This place is so dynamic. There's so much to see. It's like a journey. So the camera is going to be on the handheld rig. I'm sorry, on the steady cam rig from beginning to end. You know, and we've got 10 days to do it. Next thing I know, AY is calling the film 10 Days in Sun City as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. And that's how the name came about. Okay. And, and, and it was such a blessed experience because, you know, uh, um, Southern Sun, basically shut down Sun City for us for that duration of the shoot. We, places where you couldn't experience shutdowns were shut down completely. You but know? tell me, did, did they come on as an, as partners in yes, the film yes, in terms yeah, of yes. that they put in rands and so cents? So basically the location was handed over for completely free. for free. So the location was Goodness. already something that they had. So the location was just ours mm. to do as we wished. So there was no charge for the location pretty much. Um, AY just had to come with the budget for the uh, crew and the cast, but the component from South Africa was that Southern Sun would foot the bill for the location completely and the accommodation mm -hmm. of the cast and the crew. And, and that's how that worked out. And I think uh, Brand Essie was also involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so basically that's why that, uh, the, the coming together was such a fabulous thing. Okay. Yeah. But on the ground, did it relate in terms of like, how did the South African market receive it? And well, it, I don't think it was, well, it's, but the, the target, primary target audience was of course, uh, uh, oh, West yeah. African market. Okay. So it wasn't really marketed in South Africa okay. very well. It, it, it didn't, I, I think they wanted it to go to cinemas, but I'm like, you know, if you're going to go to the cinemas, you have to do more work. Mm. You know, it's not, not a, you, I don't think you can depend on your, popularity as mm. Africa's biggest, because in South Africa, nobody knows you. You know, we had the same problem with Jacob's Cross, you know, okay. in some way, you know, that, that the, the Nigerian actors, you know, the South Africans weren't really familiar with them, you know. So, so, so that basically affected its popularity here. But in Nigeria, it did so well. It, it, it's like in, in, in record books as being one of the best performing films in cinemas. 
already, you know, uh, when, when it came out. But why do you think so, that's so? Do you think the Nigerian market is a bit more receptive to I, I think, South African content? I think, I think, I think there's been, um, I, I, want, I want to say that, you know, South African audiences are still discovering themselves mm. to the point that they, they hold back in discovering others. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I, I think that's the case, but I might be wrong. I, you know, may, maybe, maybe one way of discovering yourself is to discover others, others first, you know? Maybe that's another way of yeah. looking at it, you know? Because uh, I think th that's the resistance we had with Jacob's Cross, that it didn't do so well in South Africa, but in Nigeria, West Africa, Ghana, Kenya, and, and the diaspora, it was a huge hit, you know? And, and I guess it's because, you know, South Africans were struggling with, okay, who am I? Yeah, and, I, and, and if, if I don't have that unpacked for me, you know, why should I be interested in somebody in else someone I'm else. Still, de still dealing with my own identity issues? Yeah. But I think also we have a big problem historically in South Africa mm. because we are very, you know, apartheid really That's it, yeah. closed our minds a lot. Yeah. And we are a nation that does not travel, especially to other African yeah. countries. Well, because, because there's no need to, mm. you know, because everything you want is here. It's here. You know, but, but the cultural exchanges, you know, the, the, the understanding that there's more to you than just meet, that, that meets the eye, you know, that's why I'm saying that it's stories that basically solve those problems. It's nothing else. It's not the government. It's not the church. You know, it's not the schools. It's basically stories. Storytelling is what basically fixes these things mm. that, 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 that inspires you to want to get up and basically cross the border, whether legally or illegally. <laughs> <laughs> Make a plan. Yeah. Make a plan. But, you know? but, yeah, but, yeah. but I'd say, I mean, just a quick one. I mean, as a director, you've also, you've worked on both like, you know, South African mm. films interna and international acquisitions mm. for platforms like Amazon Prime and Netflix. Mm. How does your approach differ when working on local versus international projects? I, I don't think I have a different approach. My approach is the same. Um, I mean, sometimes international projects just have bigger budgets. Mm. That's all. And, and what bigger budgets buy you is just more time. Yeah. That, doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a better project. Mm. Just bear that in mind. Sometimes not having enough money is your best friend mm. because that way, that means you are quite innovative and creative in how you solve problems and how you get to the point mm. that you need to get to. So you, you work faster, you work quicker, and you work smarter. Oh, yes. to arrive at, at, at solutions that will have the same emotional impact mm. on, on the audience. So, so I personally don't have a different way of, of working. You know, I mean, it might just be, okay, you have more time for prep, you have more, more money for edits and, and stuff like that, but, but the, the groundwork that goes into pre-production and production for me is the same across the board. Okay. Uh, now, I mean, I know you're also involved in, 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 in film training and mm. mentoring of programs. I mean, that indicates a commitment to nurturing the next generation of filmmakers from mm. you. What advice do you have to emerging directors and what qualities do you believe are essential for success in this business? I, I believe if you want to be successful as a filmmaker or a storyteller, you have to love stories. You have to love stories. You have to love stories more than you love food. You have to love stories more than you love sex. <laughs> you have to love stories more than you love <laughs> fast cars. Sure. Love stories, right? And then, and, and secondly, you, you need to be somebody who, who, who loves learning. Learning from others, you know, you need to be a sponge that basically absorbs and sucks as much as you can from other people. You know, whether they are male, female, white, black, foreign, indigenous, you know, rich, poor, you know, you have to be somebody who, who embraces everybody and, and, and is willing to learn from everybody. Nobody is, uh, is irrelevant as far as being able to learn and experience, you know, from is concerned. Uh, you, reader reading is 100% non-negotiable. You have to be a reader. You've, you have to read like your life depends on it, you know, because if there's load shedding, of course, you can't watch <laughs> but you can read. Reading is important. And, and I personally read a lot of nonfiction, which kind of helped me understand the world more. Because you can't really tell a story unless you have godlike knowledge of that world. Something that a wise man once said, you know, and, and the only way you can have godlike knowledge of anything is if you, know, if you study it. And, and then taste. Taste is something you must develop also. You kind of have to know what looks, what looks right on screen. You know, what, what sounds right. So, you know, what, what feels right, you know. And, and, and that taste is, is acquired over time, you know, through engaging with other people's work. You know, why is this person's work successful and this person's work is not? 
and then you develop the instinct for being able to recognize what is interesting, what is unique. You know, sometimes two things could be boring to get uh, separate, but bring them together, you know, something changes. So it's about experimentation also, trying out things. You know, with, nowadays there's phones that you can shoot with, you can edit on your, on your phone and on your laptop. And nowadays, geez, you have to go and wait. <laughs> and I think, read, when you're when you reading in the library, it was books and volumes. You were using floppies, three quarter inches to save three megabytes of, of research. You know, you, you had to just photocopy things. And today, you know, the world is basically at your fingertips. So, so if you're not voracious about wanting to know, you know, about filmmaking, right, then, then, then you're not really somebody who has been chosen who has been called by the storytelling bug, as it were. I love what you said in the mm. beginning. You said, you know, you were one who was, you were lucky to have been bitten, <laughs> chosen by the bug, yeah. and not you chasing the bug. Because yeah. we've seen so many people come and go because they, you know, they, they were chasing it and yeah. it just wasn't for them. Mm. But now with the rise of streaming platforms and digital distribution, mm. how do you see the future of African cinema evolving? And what opportunities do you think these changes present for filmmakers on the continent? Okay. So, so for, for a long time, filmmaking has been almost like a, the domain of the privileged, if you know what I mean. If you are fortunate enough to be somebody who has done good work and people know you, then it's easy for you to attract funding and to attract people you know, who want to work with you. you know? um, but then if you're not one of those, uh, how shall I say, entities, you know, what do you do? You know, how do you access funding? You know, how do you get your work out there? So, so the streaming platforms have come in to, to really help with that. that. That if you have an innovative story and, and you have an innovative idea, right, and you are able to get your foot through the door, right, chances are you might actually get your work uh, supported with, with enough money to get it made. You know, I know people who have never produced in their lives, never directed, you know, never thought they would ever actually even find themselves directing like a major TV series. But because of the streaming platforms, you know, that have created more opportunities, they now have the chance to show us what they have. And what, what the streaming platform also does is, you know, it, 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 it allows for more, for, for more people to enter into the industry space, you know, to, to, to more or less practice, for lack of a better word. Um, the issue, of course, is that, you know, the people who are the gatekeepers, you know, will we'll always want to vet your work to a particular standard, and, and that is a problem. So my, my take has always been to, 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 to do your homework very well. Imagine that every project that you're working on, you know, its failure is equivalent to the failure of your life. That way you'll be desperate enough to, to, to get it done. If, if somebody tells you you're not doing this thing correctly, maybe go back and change it, you won't feel like your ego has been snubbed you go back and make the correction and come back because you want to get the film made. So, so the streamers are, are, are a good thing in the sense that they, they, they are encouraging the proliferation of practice, which is what filmmakers need. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm a filmmaker and I make one film in five years. But imagine if you could make one film every year. Oh, man, what a dream. You know, exactly. What a dream. You know, so that's sure. what they bring to the table, you know, that, that people can practice. You know what they say about practice? It makes perfect. You know, so you make one, it works, make one, it doesn't work, you learn from it, make another one. You know, one thing about filmmaking is that this is a space that you don't shoot your wounded. If you make a bad film, it doesn't mean that you should never have been given another film again. You know, say, okay, you, 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 you've earned your stripes, let's see how you can move past the last failure and make it again. So the streaming platforms bring that. You know, if they're open-minded enough to continue to invest in, 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 in um, in, in, in experimentation, in, in people trying out new things, then all that will happen as the years go by is that the space will grow better and people and will become better and better and better. Mm. And it's funny because that's the conversation we've been having on the show mm. um, in terms of, you know, you find your Ava DuVarez, you know, we assume they started and they did well yeah. with the Selmas, but in fact, they had like, you know, two, three films before, the, which yeah. totally were terrible. Exactly. And they were given that opportunity. Yep. Yeah. So African filmmakers need to have that opportunity to make those mistakes. Absolutely. True. And now looking back at your career as a director, right? I mean, one of the mo what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned? And what are your aspirations for the future in your filmmaking journey? 
I think one of my the most valuable lessons I've learned, I think I've, I kind of have, I've already kind of alluded to, is, is the, the personal take on every story. That you, you, you have to, Martin Scorsese once said that the most personal is the most creative. And he's right, you know, you, you, a story that resonates with people is a story that comes from a personal space. And, and that for me has been the biggest lesson, you know, to try and put more and more of myself you know, into, into the stories that I work on. Because that is my take, my signature, my, my, my point of view, my lens, as it were, on the issue. And if, I, if I'm a wholesome human being, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I have a balanced way of looking at the world, then my take will resonate with many people. You know, if, if not, it will reveal itself for what it is, and maybe I should be doing something else with my life instead of being a storyteller, you know? So that has been the most valuable lesson. And, and for the future, i like to see more filmmakers come up and challenge the space, you know, with their approach and also with their scripts and their stories. You know, I'm somebody who's always keen on, you know, listening to people who have fresh ideas and, 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 and crazy, crazy, crazy concepts. And, and, and every time I hear them, I go, oh my God, wow. I would love to be able to retire. And my retirement would just be sitting down and watching all of these so true. stories that you know blow my mind, and then I look for maybe an old folks' home to go and tell them, guys, you should see the story. <laughs> <laughs> you should watch this film, you know, from this young crazy guy, you know, about X, Y, and Z. Because, because, yeah, and that that is the future. Nothing frustrates me more than seeing somebody who is a creative person, an artist, you know, with 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 several forms of self-expression not being able to express that. It must be the most frustrating feeling of not being, to, to have so much inside you that you can't articulate and nobody wants to hear it or you can't put it out in a way that people can engage with it. So, so I would love to be able to see, to be in a space where every creative person who has something to say in a meaningful way has that opportunity to say it, you know, and, be, and to be able to live off that craft and that, that, that expression to be able to provide for their families, to be able to you know, earn a living from, from, from their art, because that art is a gift. You know, it's, it's a gift, and, and gifts are supposed to make ways for you. you know, they're not supposed to, to burden you to the point of crippling you. To kind of be involved in an environment or in a landscape whereby creative people, filmmakers, especially you know, from the African continent, you know, have an opportunity to be able to to, to manifest their art and craft in a meaningful way that basically allows them to earn a living from it. I think that's what I'd like to see for, my, for myself, you know, as being kind of like a custodian or a curator of, of, of several filmmakers, storytellers, directors, you name it, you know, who all have different projects that they're working on and, and, and manifesting those projects, either as films or TV series, you know, for the, for the benefit of the audience and also for the benefit of their bank accounts because, you know, you, you have to make a living as, in one way or the other. True. So that, that, that for me is my vision for the future. That's what I'd like to see myself being involved in the future. Oh, sounds very exciting. So now we're in uh, um, <clears throat> a different segment of our show being uh, game time. So, game time. yes, sir. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be playing a, a game called Fill in the blanks in the blank yes sir sure. so basically i give you an incomplete statement and you complete it however way you want feel free okay right. we just want to see your how your creative mind actually works oh, so there's no right or wrong answers the most challenging aspect of filmmaking for me is the most challenging aspect of filmmaking for me is knowing how to end how to end? Yes. How to end the work, the film? How, how to end the film? Yeah, yeah. the toughest part of any story. Yeah. yeah. Finding how we are addicted to like uh, happy endings, or yeah, you know, we want, we want to teach people things. Did you watch uh, the film uh, Leave the World Behind? Yes. With Julia Roberts, people yes. were so disappointed with the <laughs> ending. What did you think of it? I I liked it. I did like it. I mean, yeah. I wasn't bored. I was intrigued and interested. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I liked it. I did. Yeah, yeah just I leave them with a bit of a question mark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I, in reality, sometimes stories don't really end, right? Well, no story really ends. Yeah. You know, you just stop watching. Yeah, it's true. You know, we run out of money, one of the two. But, <laughs> but no story ever ends. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Okay. My ultimate dream collaboration would be with... Hmm. James Bond. Hmm. I think so. I don't know why. I think James Bond began my journey because one of those video chess tapes that my father used to bring mm. was actually a James Bond movie. Which page James Bond was it? The Man with the Golden Gun. Okay. Wasn't well, that uh, done by... Uh, that was Roger Moore. Roger Moore. Yeah, yes, that was Roger yes. Moore. And that was the very first film I think I saw on, on the tape. And ever since then, I've been like, I can, wouldn't it be great to actually have an African be involved with making a Bond film? It's good. Mm, well, yeah, I remember there was there was a time where conversations were around um, uh, Idris Elba becoming our, our new James Bond, but yeah. it seems like that won't work. Who knows? Yeah, we'll see. if we can't take their own, we'll make our own. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So when I'm seeking inspiration, I, of, I often turn to when I'm seeking inspiration. I I, I turn to to comic books. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I tend to come with books. You're much of a reader, hey? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. If the quicker I can read it, the better. The be and comics <laughs> are like quite quick, right? One yeah. line or picture, yeah. yeah. Um, if I went in the film industry, I'd probably be... A traffic cop. Why a traffic cop? Because I'll still be directing something. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be talking about the cool drink money. I'm like, ah, this man is a capitalist. Okay. <laughs> I actually yeah. thought you'd be talking about being an engineer. Nah, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Maths would make me go to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm scared of that. Uh, oh, okay. One film that significantly impacted my approach to storytelling is... Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Goodfellas. Matthew film. Yeah. No, not really. It's about acceptance. How? That's what actually the film is about. It's about being an outsider <laughs> and seeking acceptance. That's what the film is actually really about. It. The, the mafia part is just the wallpaper, but it's really about somebody who didn't have, who didn't belong, and needed to belong. I was willing to do anything to belong. Is this Even, the one? This is the one directed by uh, Scorsese. Scorsese, yeah, yeah, yeah. Willing to sacrifice his soul to belong to something that was utterly destructive. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know why that spoke to me a lot. It's just need, needed to belong. It's such a big thing for me. That's powerful, man. Yeah. That's powerful. The most rewarding part of mentoring emerging filmmakers is uh, when they do better films than you. <laughs> it yeah. makes you feel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like Prime, eh? Mm. Like when I look at Prime, I'm like, damn it, man. Yeah. How did they just so pull that off? <laughs> that should be my name on the directing credits there. Wow. I can be, uh, from, uh, one of my young people that I mentored I had a film premiered and came out on Netflix. Mm. It's a fabulous film. Part of the Netflix NV NFF yes. slate. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful, man. Yeah. yeah. Really good, 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 good project. Yeah. When crafting a character, I prioritize. I prioritize. I think I prioritize fear. Mm. I prioritize what they fear the most mm. because most of the choices they will be, they will, they will have to make will either be influenced by what they fear or what they hope. But fear is almost more dramatic because then you can easily work your way around to what they hope for. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Interesting. Because, I mean, most lead a lead, an interesting lead character has to be on the edge, right? Mm -hmm. And that edge is usually created by that fear. Yeah. Because yeah. we all have, we all have fear. We all have fear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My favorite filmmaking memories, memory involves. Hmm. So it's interesting. It was Zone Fourteen, not just. <laughs> <laughs> it was. No, I've got, I've got so many good memories, but I think Zone Fourteen. Something about Zone Fourteen stands out. I'll try and be quick about it. But yeah, is that, I think I should just say that, right? I don't need to explain or give context. Unless you want to. No, and do you have time for context? How long is your time? Uh, no, it's, it's okay. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, okay, let's, yeah. No, you can you can give us some context. What had happened? I think it's interesting. 
Okay, yeah. so it's a, it's a very, it was a simple story, right? But, but it taught me a very big lesson. So um, there was a scene in which a major character had to die. And that character had to die because they were leaving the show. So they wanted the death scene of that character to be grand and epic, right? So the scene was directed by another director whom I will not mention. And what happened was that they fucked it up. Mm. They, they, can I say that? Yes, you can. Okay. They messed we it own up. the platform. Yeah, <laughs> they oh. messed it up so badly <laughs> that the client, which was ACBC at that time, said, nope, they want it reshot and redone. So then I was asked to go and reshoot it, just the, the sequence of the scene to, uh, of, of that character's uh, exit. And I said, okay, good. So I, the script was there. I saw what happened. Oh, the person walks back home, enters their house, and then there's a gunman waiting with a gun to basically shoot their partner, but instead shoots them instead, you know? So that's how the character died. So they shot it that way, but for some weird reason, it didn't resonate. It didn't feel strong. It didn't feel good. It, was, it, was, it fell flat. So when it was time for me to reshoot it now, I went back. I'm like, okay, so where's the gun? They said, no, there's no, you're not going to get an armor because the budget has been blown. So there's no armor. You're not going to get a gun. You're going to get a plastic gun if you're lucky. I'm like, huh? Okay, so... Like, so I didn't have an armor. I was like, okay, what about the blood squid? Because you want it to be dramatic if the person gets shot. He said, none of that, because that was used in the first attempt, and that first attempt flopped. So you're not getting any of that. All you have is just your actors and your cameras. Make it happen. Sure. So I'm like, God, how am I going to make this work? And so I thought, I thought, I thought about it. I'm like, okay, first things first. Look at the script. I'm like, okay, it was a day scene. First things first. Change it to night. So I changed it to night. And then I said, okay, what could we do? So wait, wait a minute. We could have her walk into the house. Camera could just follow her into the house, right? And then instead of seeing what actually happens with her getting shot, we cut back to outside the house and then just have the lighting guys flash their light once or twice and run from the window, right? You see the flash and then we add the sound effect of the gunshot. And, and that was it. And when we did it that way, it blew everybody away. Like it was horrifying. People were like, <gasps> like the tears that came out when the episode was viewed and people were calling me. I'm like, but I didn't show you guys anything. I didn't say anything. The rest was in your mind. You made it up. You were the one who imagined how she was killed. I didn't show you anything. The rest was just your fears manifesting. So Less that, is more. Less is more. Yeah. Okay, so now we're introducing a new uh, mini segment okay. called Put Them On. Okay. Essentially, it's, it's all about putting on, you know, uh, highlighting any upcoming filmmakers mm. in whatever cap capacity, okay. you know, that we think we should check out. Mm. So since you're a film mentor and you mentor filmmakers, mm -hmm. do you have anyone or two people that you think that we should look out for? Hmm. Yes. Um, okay. Watch out for Tabiso Christopher, guys. Oh, yeah. We're he's having him soon. He's coming strong. Oh. Watch out for Sitley there. <laughs> Sidley is coming strong. <laughs> well, you'll soon have her on this seat very soon. <laughs> As you may have noticed already. <laughs> I'd say thank you so much yeah. for gracing us with your presence. Thank you. Your, our conversation has been very, very informative, mm. entertaining, enlightening, and I think all of us will have something to take home with us. Thank you for continuing to tell our African stories, for keeping the flag raised high, for being brave, fearless and for being as creative and as a, a, a bigger brother figure that you've been in this industry. We really appreciate you and we hope and pray that you have, may you have many more years to manifest these stories that have been haunting you and um, may you give us a sense of pride in our African narrative. Thank you. No, thank you guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Ooh, thank you. We would like to thank Fortune Well, the Magic Lightbox Company, as well as the Dynamic Workspace for sponsoring this episode. Mm -hmm.